Suppose uh, everybody here is very familiar with this interface, this web page. And if you, you were reading Claire Santry yesterday, I think it was Monday, and she came up with a scoop, which uh, I wasn't privy to, and I, I asked, hello, I asked Hike here, and he's going to reveal a few things tonight. So um, it's very the time is very appropriate. The last time I spoke with Ty, barred a few phone calls in the last day, a couple of days, was I think last January or February, was it, when we yeah, decided on this? Yeah. So it's a long time back we made this, we picked this night. We didn't know that Ireland would be uh, playing Denmark in the playoffs of the World Cup, so uh, that's just the way it pans out. So any, I know you don't need to to see me, so without any further ado, I think I'll hand you over to Ty. Thank, Thank you very much. Sure. Say thank you for the warm welcome this evening, and I'm just delighted to share some insight into how I suppose this website has gone from strength to strength in the last decade. Uh, some aspects of the website, just to speak about I suppose what is scheduled for the future, which yeah. Yeah, the scoop is probably some of it has been broken maybe. Um, I suppose to start, just to look back at suppose the, the origins of the website, and I don't know if any of you recall a company called Irish Genealogy Limited. But it was set up in the early 1990s uh, by the Department of Taoiseach and it began functioning from about 1996 onwards. And at the time, its main objectives were, and it was had a lot, was one, to provide information on genealogical and settlement patterns in areas of the island of Ireland. And another was to stimulate education about the heritage and the environment of the island, uh, to foster and encourage genealogical and other research to increase knowledge about the island of Ireland <coughs> and its peoples throughout the world, to further these objects by promoting and developing in the island of Ireland a genealogical service for those seeking information on their Irish ancestry, all of these services to benefit and assist in the development of local communities and in the development of tourism, and to market these services at home and overseas. And it was quite a, a lengthy list, I suppose, for one body to try and achieve. The board consisted of uh, 40 members, the Irish Family History Foundation had five. There was two from um, the Association of Professional Genealogists, uh, one from the Association of Ulster Genealogists, uh, three were nominated by the Department of Teaching. It was revolutionary enough at the time, there was two nominated from the Department of Finance in Northern Ireland. The actual start date of the website, irishgenealogy.ie, I'm not certain of, <coughs> there's a fantastic uh, website called the Wayback Machine, I don't know if anybody ever has used it. <coughs> but I was able to find a version of going back to 2000, and I'm just going to show you a version going back to 2001. So that's Irish Genealogy in 2001. And as you can see, it's called the Irish Genealogical Project. And there is. <coughs> Excuse me. Organizations are represented on the on the bottom left here. As you can see, there are the, the three principal genealogy organizations, I suppose, along with the, the public interest representatives. And I'm just going to skip forward a few years. This is the site in 2006. This is when I joined the Department of Arts, and I became involved, I suppose, dealing with Irish Genealogy Limited, as it was then. So there's one aspect on the website that was new at this stage, which was this one, search 3.6 million records free. So it had changed just from an information site to one as well that had kind of a genealogy records on it. And just to show you here, hopefully this will work now. See, this is the primary uh, source of the information, which is some of the Irish Family Foundation centres. And you have gravestones in index and war memorials. And the IGL itself would have provided the administration, would have taken the, the orders. And it was similar, I suppose, to the way the centres operated at the time. You sent in an order and <coughs> it was processed. So what it would have. Irish genealogy handle on that would have handed on the money to <coughs> the individual centres and got the made sure that whatever was ordered was was followed up on. And 
So that's the, the website in 2006 and what was on it. So moving forward, I suppose, to why the department uh, took over the website. In 2008, at its AGM, in September 2008, the Board of Arts Genealogy agreed to come live with a request of the, of the then Department of Arts, Sport and Tourism um, to initiate the dissolution and wind up of its activities. And at the same time, the, all departments were looking at se state and semi state agencies. And in the, in, as a result, there was resulted in the, the department reviewing the role, status of all such agencies, and I suppose, you know, whether they were operating to the, the best of their abilities. So IGL agreed to, to wind up at that stage. And it was formed we wound up in 2009. And just take it back slightly because at that stage the department had become more heavily involved and was, I suppose, looking at the, the record sets and you know what was available and what was not. So back in 2007, the department took a, a decision to pursue the computerization of church records in areas not covered by the Irish Family History Foundation Centres. So these areas included Dumb City, uh, County Kerry, and South and West Cork. And so the department, in conjunction with Dumb City Public Library, secured secure the computerization of church records that had been indexed by the Dublin Heritage Group. And Dublin Heritage Group operated similar to other local genealogy centres throughout Ireland. The centres were usually managed by boards, they had one or two full time staff, and the remainder of the staff were <coughs> made up of false trainees. They transcribed the church record onto usually index cards. And subsequently, that was usually put onto a you know onto a database to be eventually looked at, I suppose, in, maybe in this manner or at least by the centre here. And the only major difference at the time was Dumb City Public Library ran that centre, and that had wound up a few years previously, and its work had not been completed. At the same time, Dumb City Public Library, uh, the National Archives, the National Library, and the Department uh, cooperated on a scoping group, and they were to establish the options to look at computerising church records and what was remained that hadn't been done yet. So these were the ones that hadn't been either indexed or transcribed in any form. Um, the group established that in the absence of the original records, the use of microfilm copies of the records was perfectly feasible subject to strong oversight from a qualified person. So officials from the department made contact in at the time with centres including Cork City and Kerry. And these centres, along with Bunty Public Library, had previously sought funding from our Irish Genealogy Limited and for the completion of their records at, at that time. So we were followed up on that and those contacts they had originally made. We also made contact with uh, Carlow County Library, as the centre there had also closed, and those records were held by Carlow County Library. And this time, the contacts with Kerry, Cork, and Carlow proved very positive. Um, in Kerry, the majority of the church records were complete, both Roman Catholic and Church of Ireland. The centre in Kerry was closed up, and with the support of the department, the remainder of the Roman Catholic records that had been indexed but not computerised were then completed, and funding was provided to the centre board to complete this task commercially on the basis of competitive tender process. And in 2009, the Kerry Genealogical Research Centre officially handed over its records to the department for inclusion on a website. A repository of information. <coughs> in Cork, the department held discussions again with the county librarian, and the we found out at that stage in the Cork city that eight of the ten parishes, of the Roman Catholic parishes, had been completed by Cork, but two of them had not been, and there was no centre in operation at that stage, and the rest of uh, sort of the diocese of Cork and Ross as well had not been done. There was uh, another separate centre in, in the Klein region, so that was posted up and running, and those, are, those records were available online in the Irish Family History Foundation website. Uh, as I said, Carlo had completed Roman Catholic records, um, but it, didn't have, it had no church garden records. And at, at that stage, the centre was closed, and there was no effort being made to make it, to get a new centre up and running or to put the records that they had online. <coughs> so, with the decision to wind up Irish Genealogy Limited in 2008, the department funded computerization of church records in Dumb City Public Library, and in return, they agreed to, to transfer those records to the department for placing on a single website repository of information. And now, in 2008, just as Irish Genealogy Limited was winding up, 
they have talks with the National Archives that maybe they might take on this role. They already were working on the census online and other, and other works. But at the time, because they didn't have a, a digital archivist, they felt they couldn't take on this role. So the decision to wind up Irish and Yachty Limited kind of at the same time came fortuitously because that meant the, the assets of the company transferred to the Minister uh, of the day, Minister for Arts, Sport and Tourism. And basically the only assets at the time were the website and some computers of, that were probably of little value at that stage. So the department took these items in charge. It also had the files of Irish and Yachty Limited uh, stored both electronically and physically. And it was decided at this stage that the website should be kept going and maintained first of all as a promotional tool in Ireland uh, for genealogy in Ireland. And it was kind of redeveloped as such in 2009. At the same time, <coughs> following the decision of the Kerry Centre to complete its records for County Kerry and hand them over to the department, uh, it was decided that the Roman Catholic and Church of Ireland records for Dublin and Kerry would be placed on Irish genealogy not having. The resulting website was relaunched in late 2009 uh, at Archbishop Marshall's Library here in Dublin by the Dean Minister uh, Martin Cullen TD. And I'll just show you what the, the website looked at the time. And there's Martin. Um, so the website, as I said, was launched, we relaunched in 2009. Um, <coughs> so it carried much of the information as well as there was in previous versions of the website. And uh, central signpost and index should be there as well. It's you can see it on the top left corner there, it's not probably showing as well as it could do. And but at the same time now you had one point three million church records available to view um, for the first time as well as for, for Dublin City and for Kerry. And uh, these were all free I suppose as well as the other major bonus as well. The, the department was allowed by the National Archives to use and utilise the web server that also carries the 1901-1911 census records. And it also used the company contracted by the National Archives for the maintenance of the new church records search, search mechanism. So if you're ever on a census site or on our site, you'll probably notice there is similarities in how they, they carry out the search and so on. Um, it also included a feedback page, which I can't do spot there, but anyway, you have to take my word for it. There was a feedback page added at that stage, and I suppose it's proved a very useful tool. It allows us to see what does and doesn't work on the site, and to, to react, I suppose, to, you know, where, where possible to anything people bring to our attention, or you know, highlight something maybe that we hadn't spotted in the putting it up online. Now, at the same time, uh, officials from the department met with the representative church body library in 2009 to discuss possible access to the church of Ireland records that the RCBL held. And the, I, I should say, it was, it was always been named just for the areas where no uh, church records were available online. And the National Library <coughs> had also agreed the department could use the microfilm records of the Roman Catholic Church baptism, marriage, and burial that they held for tokenization. So the department actually went to tender for two projects in 2009. First, the imaging and computerization from the original Church of Ireland records of baptism, marriage and burial held by the representative church body library for Dublin City, Carlow and Kerry. <coughs> the second tender was for the imaging and computerization from microfilm copies of Roman Catholic church, baptism, marriage and burial records held by the National Library for the diocesan area of Cork and Ross. And As I said initially, the, there was 1.3 million Roman Catholic and Church of Ireland records for Dublin City and, and for Kerry. And then in 2010, the Minister for Tourism, Culture and Sport, Mary Hannafin TD, along with the Church of Ireland Archbishop of Dublin, they launched a further 700,000 <coughs> Catholic and Church of Ireland records for Dublin City, Kerry, Carlow and Cork. And this brought the number of records available to view to over 2 million at this stage. And the big change here was that 700,000 records that also included the image taken from the original or microfilm copy of the registers, similar to the 1901-1911 census website. And this move to include the original image with the transcription of the church record was hailed as being a very important step in how such records should be displayed, because it allowed you the opportunity to, to query the, the transcription and see that it was correct. And as I said, 
the, well, there was one final <coughs> tender for computerization in 2010, again to, to computerize the remaining Cork, um, Cork and Ross records and the Dublin City records, and these were all the Roman Catholic records. The, so two further contracts were awarded at this stage for 600,000 uh, records for Dublin and 300,000 for Cork. And in all these cases, an independent genealogist was also appointed to oversee the quality of the work, to, to verify that it was <coughs> met the standards, and to, you know to do sampling and so on. And as I said, these contracts were based on the microfilm copies of the records held by the National Library. And so once these records were completed, they were launched on the website in October 2011 by the then Minister for Arts, Heritage and the Wizard, uh, by Jimmy Dean and TD. I'll show you that. The website at this stage. So, as you can see, the, the look has changed. And I should add, I suppose, that by this stage, the central signposting index had been taken down at the request of the Art Family Foundation. They had their own website now. They didn't need <coughs> an alternative version. Oh. <coughs> and so that's, at that stage, then it was kind of a, a change in how it looks and so on. And, some information, updates there, how to search some of the places of interest to look and stuff like that. And again, and also I suppose the emphasis on, you know, the, the, set, the website is also to draw people there and, you know, research their ancestry, find their roots and maybe hopefully visit. <coughs> so at the same time, the department was working on a national genealogy policy. Um, this was in line with the program for government. And the genealogy policy was set up in a, <coughs> kind of a phased approach. So phase one was to make available the online the genealogical records to the department and of key agencies within its ambit, which includes the National Library and the National Archives of Ireland, by developing the website Irish Genealogy as a virtual entry point and portal for those wishing to search for genealogical records. This phase was to be delivered in time for the gathering in 2013. Phase two was to advance discussion with other state entities, notably the General Register Office, to facilitate access to their records through Irish genealogy, and to advance to the, the establishment of the National Genealogical Office, a joint venture between the National Library and the National Archives, with discussions to be had with the Department of Transport, Tourism and Sport for the purpose of examining a possibility of a national diaspora centre. And phase three, to enter into negotiations with non-state bodies holding genealogy records with a view to enabling access to them through the Irish genealogy portal. So that was the, the national genealogy policy adopted in 2012. So in March 2013, <coughs> phase one was completed with the relaunch of the website to include a portal and this allowed users to search a, a variety of websites and the launch took place in the Royal Irish Academy and I'll show you how the website appeared following the launch. So, and again, is it a bit of a change again from the, the previous version? And here, on the right, is where the portal element comes in, where you could just input your search, press search, and then you're through to a variety of, I suppose, uh, websites and so on that the portal will allow you access to. And at the time, this included the church records on Irish genealogy. The 1901-1911 census records held by the National Archives, tide appointments by the National Archives, you had soldiers' wills, uh, Griffiths' valuations, the Ireland-Australia transportation database, uh, the military archives, Ellis Island records, and the National Photographic Archive in the National Library. Um, there was also an updated guide on how to carry out research, which you see there in the middle, research in Ireland. Turn it over. And this element of here was written by the genealogist John Brennan. And the launch did coincide, thankfully, with the gathering in 2013. And I think it's fair to say that the gathering was a fairly successful initiative and did seem to <coughs> you know, strike a fairly good note for a lot of people around the country to organise initiatives themselves as well. So it was important to, that the, the website as well kept up with that as well at the same time. Phase two of the, the National Genealogy Policy is aimed to, as I said, was aimed to advance discussions with other state entities, most notably the General Register Office, to facilitate access to their records through Irish genealogy. And this was gathering pace at this stage. 
the legis legislative provision allowing for transfer of data from the general register office um, oh no, was through the de Department of Social Protection or rules of Hamid they come under was allowed to the Minister for Arts heard and waived it through amendment of the Civil Registration Act which in the Social Welfare Act of 2013 and uh, this allowed for the Minister <coughs> to legally provide access to the index of the registers <coughs> to the GRO civil records and this is the notice that comes up when you're after you've gone through the CAPTCHA, there's a notice that comes up on the civil records page and it's section 61 of the, the 2004 Civil Registration Act and the, it's the same like if you go to Warburg Street you fill out a form it's basically a, 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 you're asking this, the civil registrar to search the records and it's a similar kind of online format in, in, in the same way now I suppose it, it should seem straightforward enough when you're take a set of computer or the records from one body and just pop them up online but uh, you know it is a what can seem quite simple is often can become very convoluted quickly the GRO for years had had previously begun a modernization program and that included the computerization of the indexes of births, marriages, and deaths however not all of this work had or I suppose I should say is fully completed for a start, marriage entries in the index did not show the other spouse on the computer version, but they were now being joined to a certain date. And this only went back so far, but it's supposed to. So when we originally came along, it said, you know, that's great, we'll take the records. We had to kind of understand this was what they had done and what they hadn't done and when they were doing it. Um, so it was two sets of data in some respects. And one where the entries are fully computerized, and there's a reference to them called the group registration ID. And I think when they came online, this caused a little bit of confusion because most people were used to the, the old book uh, reference where the page number, the quarter, and so on is given. And so that was gone when the GRO computerized their, their, the records that they, they added this number to each individual record, and that's their, their reference number from now on. Um, we also had issues like things like geographic reference points. So a place like Carrick and Shannon, you would get abbreviations, you would get hyphenation, you would get no gap between the on, the Carrick on Shannon, or a gap, no capitalization as I said. And so you ended up with, you were trying to ask the computer to search for one area, and then next one it was throwing up a, a myriad of results because of that. So it was important as well just to kind of you know streamline as well some of the the locations and, and stuff like that as well because that causes difficulty to people who wouldn't be too used to looking for it. Um, the I suppose much of that work was carried out on a test website, so kind of just a test version of the Irish genealogy website that would be would work between ourselves and the general register office on. So and they'd give us the stuff, we'd look at it and they'd say. And you go back and test it and see how it looks against your own records. So, uh, jump on a page here. So going back to, uh, sorry, 3rd of July 2014, I've written the wrong date here myself. They soon to be then, Tawnish and Minister for Social Protection, Joan Burton TD, along with our Minister for uh, Arts, Surgeon and Wales, Jimmy and TD, launched the online search facility on the website. So this allowed users to search <coughs> millions of index entries of births, marriages and deaths. The only restriction placed on the data at this launch was that no birth, marriage or death record relating to a minor, who would have been a minor at that stage, was to be made available online. So I'll just show you quickly what the website looked when we launched it. And this is shortly afterwards. <laughs> now, in spite of a broad welcome for the uploading of these records, uh, problems were to arise within a few weeks when the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner contacted the department seeking the immediate closure of the civil records online access. It's, I suppose, fair to say what transpired you know, was covered by the media at the time. But essentially, the Office of the Data Protection Commissioner were concerned that the information related to living persons being made available online and that somehow this could be used because it's on a website that it would speed up the process of you know, people using that data for nefarious means. Now, it is available to the public in Warrenbrook Street, so I suppose you know, we were 
putting it online in a similar format. So eventually, we were allowed to put it back online, but we had to put on a kind of a time limit, I suppose. So you're probably aware now that there's a time limit of um, we can only show births a hundred years or more. Uh, marriages can only be 75 years old or more, and debts are 50 years or more. And the relaunch of the indexes took place in April 2015. I think I might have been there. Oh, there you go. They're back. <laughs> and I suppose uh, the quote, uh, it's a quote attributed to Abraham Lincoln, I suppose, amongst others. And I think it holds true maybe in, rela in relation to the decision to make available the index data at the time. You can please some of the people some of the time, all of the people some of the time, some of the people all the time, but you can never please all of the people all of the time. And uh, so <coughs> in April 2015, the indexes came back <coughs> with uh, the limit, as you can see here now. Now, the, I suppose the primary goal was to open up what was kind of a hidden data source to people across the globe, and it was cheap as well. The, but the index themselves will only prove useful if you had some prior information to go on, and particularly like if you're looking for a very common surname, you know, Murphy and Cork or something like that would be, would be a needle in a haystack in some respects. So without the, the need the images are supposed to, to, to make them more valuable. <coughs> and once the dust settled and the indexes were safely back in line, we, you know, we were able to turn our thoughts to adding the register images onto the, the website to accompany that index data. So provision for that was, was allowed in the Civil Registration Amendment Act of 2014. And this essentially allowed the Minister the ability to allow access to register images online. And whereas the previous piece of legislation was just for the indexes, this also didn't include provision for the, to allow the, the register for images themselves and kind of name them and everything. So again, as I said, it, was, it should be a relatively straightforward piece taking what the, the GRO have done and popping it up online, but uh, again, you know, progress is rarely comes in a, a straight line. So the first thing we had to do, obviously, was talk to our friends in the Data Protection Commissioner, just to make sure that uh, we were doing the right thing. Uh, so once bitten, twice shy, you could say. And uh, as I said before, the, the data collection commissioner's main concern is uh, persons who are living. So <coughs> there is, if you ever uh, read the census reports, or, or even you know, see the odd report in the paper about uh, somebody getting the, the president's bounty, you'll know that people do reach the age of 100 and are still alive. So there is always the possibility that someone who is 101 or 76 years married will, you know, um, their record will go online. So we had to establish a mechanism where in the event a person did object that we can they can inform us and we can act by redacting that part of the image in question if need be. Um, so we have the mechanism up, but thankfully no one has contacted us yet. And I'll just give you show you where it is, in case you ever feel like making that complaint. So there's a notice concerning Possible redaction of historic images 75 years old. And here's the one about historic birth records. And obviously, the death records like, don't apply. <laughs> but that's where, if anybody wants to, to make that complaint. Now, we have a few emails coming through that way, I write sometimes, but generally they're actually queries. So people just find the, 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 the way to get to us, I suppose, to contact us rather than actually nobody has actually said anything about. I want to cancel, or I don't want to take down something that's up there. Um, another issue, I suppose, we had, which when we got the, they said, the GRO, when they look at them, they know what they're looking at. They have their own way of doing it, I suppose, as well. It's an internal mechanism and so on. So to make that available to the public without it causing confusion sometimes, and one of those issues was uh, cancelled or amended entries. And in some cases, you could have three or four images attached to an index entry because of the amount of amendments on the register page. So I suppose we have to get an understanding of how the GRO deal with the, the entries, um, how they were previously shown to members of the public as well as important. So if you ordered a copy, a certificate, you only got the correct copy. You didn't see that there was an amendment ever. 
So C. So what might happen is you'd be looking for an entry and then you'd see the wrong entry and it might cause a bit of confusion, we thought. So we were just worried about that. And the big fear, as I said, would be confused. But the change in of it proved to be you know, wasn't realistic. Um, it would have involved a, a lot of going through every single image or any one that's linked where there's multiple images and trying to take it out and sort it out, whatever. And in the end we said we just put it up as it was. And thankfully the data doesn't cause much confusion, but I'll give you a brief example here. So here you go, you see there's two images. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, Amelia Mortimer. Uh -huh. <laughs> My old friend can't show Get it right the first time. <laughs> well, I'm always a great believer in the You just keep going at it. Just sort of yeah, the the <laughs> there's another road. Tell me if, if I'm missing a road there. No. That's not a road, is it? There's a problem with it. Yes, there is a road. Yeah. There. Yeah. For some reason. Type of JB. It's very cold. Birds. Well, do you remember who you were looking for? Angela Mortimer. Amelia, I think, wasn't there? She was there. Yeah. Now, I think Amelia's okay, but I see a certified copy up here on the right of the screen. So that's causing. Now, I don't want to go through that process again. So we just look for Amelia again. Oh, we might just go back there. Let's go into it again. I should, yeah, there you go. So, there's a different entry for a Kathleen. And that's not, as you can see, so that's not Amelia. Amelia was fine, but that's a different person altogether. So, it's just to not cause that confusion at the same time. But, as I said, most people have worked it out. They've probably seen that, like, you know, the little notation on the side of the screen saying C certified copy from the no, that that's a different image. And they don't need to worry about that. So we have rarely got to maybe just a question about it. But thankfully today, you know, not too much confusion. So I suppose once this and a few other kinks were ironed out, the site was ready to be uh, updated with the civil registry images. And this launch took place on the 8th of September 2016 last year. It was uh, the launch took place with the Minister for Social Protection and now Tisha Cleo Radcliffe TD and the Minister for Arts, Heritage, Regional, Rural and Gwaith Affairs, and we've changed our title since again, uh, Heather Humphreys TD, and at the launch we had the grandson of the Antarctic explorer Tom Crean as well as a special guest, and on the day we were able to display Tom Crean's birth register entry, <coughs> his marriage registration entry, and his death registration entry, and we were also able to show some of the death register entries of the Easter Rising uh, proclamation entries, and many of these entries actually date from 2000, um, and they were added to the register at the time at the request of Bertie Hearn and the um, because for some reason they weren't registered back in 1916. I think I have Show you a different one. Oh, we have to match on the background. Maybe. <laughs> the in that, I suppose this takes place, but if you look, you can find James Connolly, and I think Houston and Mallon are on the same page, and it gives a, an exact description of how they died and everything. Whereas the 
the 2000s. I think the probable cause of death was given as execution or something like that, but people didn't like it as a, being given as a probable cause. I mean, you know, the historical fact, I suppose, is known by the coroner's reports and that, I suppose, the registrar is only allowed to register certain information. But here, I'll just highlight a bit more. Is that's Thomas Ash in 1917, and heart failure, and something I think it's Congest compression of lungs, congestion of lungs, congestion of lungs. Hospital as well. Well, since the, that launch, I suppose there's been near universal praise. I suppose the fact that these records are there to view, and it's in, attracted a and sparked a great amount of feedback. And uh, I just did a count of the emails I received in September, and there were over 180 emails. And the majority, I suppose, they require usually some kind of response. Anyway. Many of them are looking for updates, I suppose, and others are, they can't find stuff, or they're unsure. So I suppose we try and help them if we can, but you know, it's, uh, we don't go into a full genealogical research for anyone either, and say, you know, I just encourage them to use the site and to try and discover what they can from it. But I suppose sometimes point out ways that maybe they might have been looking at something wrong or whatever. Um, I suppose we also get praise, thankfully. So I just give you an example of one. I would like to thank all the staff at Irish Genealogy for all their hard work and effort to make this database what it is. Irish Genealogy has literally changed my life. Many years ago, I tried to research my family tree when sites like this weren't available, and I got nowhere. Thanks to this site, I'm back as far as 1850 on my father's site and have visited, even visited the house that my fourth great-grandparents lived in. I'm also, I've also recently discovered that my second great-grandfather was killed in World War I fighting the Germans and I plan to visit his grave in France next year. Nobody in my family had any idea about his service. On my mother's side, I'm back as far as 1527 Kent, England. So it must be a little right there. My grandmother was 90 last week and she didn't know her grandparents. Hughes provided all the info I needed to present to her for a 90th present. None of this would be possible without your site, and I thank everyone about it. I suppose in reading these, I sometimes have an American accent in my head. <laughs> the, um, and this could be one other message. Uh, just wanted to give you a attaboy for all the work on this wonderful site. It's been a godsend in confirming dates and families. I've been working on my family for 50 years, and this site has offered the most breakthroughs in many, many years. Thank you. Looking forward to the next update. Um, in terms of the, site, the numbers visiting the site, they, I mean, they're, they're quite staggering. I think, you know, the, there's over a quarter of a million visitors this year would probably have visited the civil records section of the site alone. They could be just coming at it from the civil records section, so it's, it's not easy to get a full grasp of the full numbers visiting the site overall in its totality. Um, so I suppose at the same time that civil registers were being added in September last year and the launch was taking place, there was also other work underway on the September <coughs> project. And I think the credit for this must go to Katrina Crow, who is now retired from the National Archives. She spearheaded the venture since the, the 1916. Yeah. It's called 2016 Family History. And I'm telling you about it. I'll just pass these two documents around. One to one side of the room, and you might see it now in the dark, of course. <laughs> um, she spearheaded, Katrina spearheaded the venture, uh, along with the genealogist John Grenham and Mary O'Duvon. She was a retired history teacher. Um, and what I'll do is I'll play 
I never checked. Is this a volume? Oh, right, sure. <laughs> okay. The chance of you, we see how it goes. Tracing your ancestors is difficult, either because records don't survive or because the ones that do are complicated. In fact, it's never been easier. This website is part of the state's response to the centenary of 1960. We want people to know that they can go on that interesting and fascinating journey of tracing their ancestors who may or may not have been connected with the national struggle. But in any case, they are going to find out fascinating things about their ancestors that they might not have known before. There are seven modules on the website concerned with surnames, place names, census records, state records of births, marriages and death, church records, property records and military records. Each is self-contained so you can take them exactly at your own pace. There are examples, there are little puzzles with the answers that you can go through. And the idea is that you can sit down for 20 minutes and get a good grasp of what you're going to find in a census record and how you're going to go about it. The same for the church records and so on. There seems to be a very special thing that happens to people when they find an ancestor. It's a, a sort of link with the past that's unique to that person. It can be a very special thing to look at a record and see the signature of your great-grandmother or your great-grandfather on it, that they actually wrote this in their own handwriting. It really is addictive. There is a very sweet puzzle-solving hit that you get of finding the right ancestor and discovering things about them and using what you discover to find more. We want people to understand that this is not a difficult thing to do and it can be a very rewarding and wonderful thing to do. And the site is aimed primarily at second level students to use in the classroom, but also to download the resources that they find on the site. And we realised that this would be useful for the general population too. This is a way of bringing the material together so that people can understand that they can actually do much more. All of these things are now available online in a way that they weren't until recently. So we want to reassure people, particularly second level students, but the general population too, that it is now relatively easy to research your family and we want to show you how to do that. The sound would almost be cut. No, essentially it was well. They just given out they were given an outline on the site and in the different parts then there's there's a video no, you probably mostly might be aware of this. But you have the modules. So there's the hints and tips, and information on surnames, place names, the census records, civil records, church records, property records, and military records. Mm -hmm. And I think in the majority of them, John Brennan gives a little overview at the start as well. And then just jumping on here, you have the case studies. Um, Sean Lamass and John Purcell. So the, the point of the case studies is supposed to just to give the idea of the breadth of records that were available that showcase, first of all, I suppose Sean Lamass because he was famous. So he's, his role in 1916 and he's you know, becoming teacher in later years and so on. But John Purcell then is a, a different example because he's just an ordinary person and it was just that he, he can be found and his ancestry can be found in let's say the civil, the census, the church records and so on that are online and it's just to give people a good idea of you know, how much detail they're supposed to can find about a person in their family. Uh, it's also a learning resource and uh, one of the booklets I, I sent around there is the one that is on Skullnet. Skullnet is a, it's kind of for secondary school teachers and it's a kind of a portal that they use. So in this case it's just, I suppose mainly for the history teachers and so on they can take the learning resource and use it as a way to show uh, their students and I suppose it was aimed maybe probably at transition year especially and that they could do, you know, they could actually take it as a kind of to do a case study on, on their own family and stuff and, and you know where to look and how to access the material and so on so it's just a, and at the same time we had to be cognizant I suppose when we were creating that not all students now in school 
are of Irish descent. So it was to add that, you know, that wherever they were from, to try and add in what they could find, as well as what their own heritage and ancestry as well. So, you know, that nobody would be left out either at the same time. Um, so that was launched uh, earlier this year in uh, the Park School in Donnybrook. And there was another link in it to 2016 as well, was a the learning resources or a study on Sean McDermott, and even that it's most, it, it highlights was the amount of information now that's available about the, that kind of revolutionary period, and also it highlights the children, you know, to the school kids and stuff like that, you know, their first time maybe going into research and stuff, things like Sean McDermott would have been McDermott, you know, in census forms and so on, and to, to look out for that kind of um, changes that could have taken place as well, with people's names and so on. Pop back into the, the main side. So, I suppose, finally, I know that you're eager to hear about what's coming next on the website. And he got a bit of a surprise. <coughs> Tony told me that there was stuff up on the website. No, on, on, a, on a blog. But, but I think it is there. Yeah. Um, essentially, we are working with the Giro to go back to, first of all, the the aim is to get all the marriage and all the death records up online, so all the images. And so we've been working with the Euro. We got marriage, we got birth uh, records. So we got an extra year of marriages and an extra year of births, and we got marriages going back to 1870. Now, they were only on the test site, and we were having difficulty with some aspects. So I think in the last instruction to, to test it, maybe it went on the live site rather than the test site. So it looks like it's an early Christmas present for, for people, but the aim is we're, all, we're due to get death indexes as well soon. So 1870 for marriages and 1878 for deaths will be the new dates. I'll just show you actually here what we currently have. So current years, there are 1882 for the marriages, so 1940 for the images, and deaths, 1891 to 1965. So essentially, births will be 1916, but have marriages 1870 to 1941, deaths 1878 to 1966, and obviously as every year goes by, the aim is uh, is to bring up an extra year. So this year 1917 for births, 1942 for marriages, 1967 for the deaths, and at the same time, the aim is to go back to 1864 for the deaths and 1845 eventually for all marriages and we hope that by the middle of next year we'll achieve that um, so as I said we had the marriages and births already sent to us we were testing them out so it appears that some of them have gone online already so um, just the, the, the aim as I said is to get the death ones up so the hope the, the, the aim is to, to add them all together I suppose but that's fine that some of them have popped up online anyway already um, so hopefully nobody will crash the, the website in, the, in their <laughs> eagerness to... Because <laughs> I don't know if you, like last year, when we did do the launch, there was a brief period where, like, you know, it was, it was actually, when you see the stats, the amount of, you know, people going in to have a look, it does, you know, it goes through the roof, and it does kind of put a bit of pressure on the site as well, and, uh, but, you know, we, we, we aim not to, to have it happen, but sometimes, you know, you get the best will in the world. But we get we got it back up and running fairly quickly, and I suppose other news. This year, the department advertised the digitisation scheme, and one of the recipients of funding uh, will be the representative church body library, and they have plans to make a digital copy of all the registers, all the church registers that they hold, all you know, well, the historic ones anyway. Right. So they are getting some funding to start off on that on that project, and. So eventually, I suppose, there will be a digital version of all the original registers going past, you know, up to a certain period of time. Anyway. And there is one other bit. The will be an announcement soon about other records from the General Register Office, but I won't be able to divulge that tonight, but just to say that it will go to press soon and keep your eyes and ears open. So thank you very much for welcoming me here, Steve.